recording yet? Okay, awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another one of the APSA's interactive sessions of the 2023 and 2024 academic year. Um, we're really pleased to host tonight's webinar with current trainees to answer general questions about the secondary application process. I'd like to now introduce our panelists, and I will call on them one by one to go and introduce themselves. So please state um, your current institution and um, maybe one line about uh, secondaries or any other general advice you'd like to share right now. So to start off, um, Mika. Hi everyone, my name is Mika Materovatnik. I'm a first year, actually now second year MDPhD student at UCSF um, or University of California, San Francisco. Um, I would start off with talking about um, the importance of knowing sort of the values of the institution that you're applying to. Uh, and by values, I mean, what are their priorities and making sure that you know those before you write your secondaries. And I can definitely talk a lot more about that um, throughout the session, but um, I just wanted to highlight that. Great. Akshata? Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay. My name is Akshata. I am an incoming G1, so first year in the graduate side of the MD-PhD program at the University of Cincinnati. And my strongest piece of advice for secondaries is to be organized, whatever that looks like for you. Um, because as you probably know, you have a lot of different applications out there. And so it can get kind of overwhelming to keep track of all of the essays and other little components that have to be done for each application to be marked as complete. So make sure to stay organized, whatever that looks like for you. Great, next is Jonathan. Hi everybody, I'm John. I am a second year MD PhD student at Emory University. And my advice is start early. There's nothing stopping you from starting your writing before anyone has sent out a secondary. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate on that more as we go on. Great. I echo that one, John. <laughs> um, next one is Carl. Hi, everybody. I'm Carl. Uh, I'm an incoming M1 at Purdue University and Indiana University. Um, I guess a piece of the general advice is don't be afraid to ask. Opportunities are everywhere, but if you don't ask, you'll never find them. So um, make sure to ask um, professors, your your fellow uh, classmates, colleagues, and uh, things will definitely pop up. Awesome. Um, next up is Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm a entering GS2, so fourth year in the program at the University of Florida. Um, I can vouch for saying organizing and timing is also very important, um, but secondaries are hard because all schools treat them differently in the review process. So the biggest thing to understand is to get to know the school um, because this is your time to actually relate to the school specifically and why you're the best fit for that program. Great, and last but not least, Zoe. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe. I'm an incoming M1 uh, at the University of Michigan. And I guess my advice is probably applicable to a lot of PhD programs, but I'll be going into anthropology, which is non-traditional. And it's really important to know which graduation grad materials are basically due around the time of secondary. So really getting to know the programs that you're interested in and then honing in those graduate materials, like your statement of purpose um, that they might ask for at that time and having a lot of eyes on it is, uh, is super important. And I'm super happy to talk about some more of the specificities of the non-traditional PhD programs later on. Awesome. And thank you to all the panelists for being here tonight, um, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, share your pearls of wisdom with our audience members today. Um, so uh, my name is Rohini. I will be your moderator this evening. I'm a rising second year MD PhD student at Stony Brook University. And in the chat box, we have Salim helping us today and Min as well. Um, and so for for now, if any of you uh, in the audience will be stepping away at any point, that's okay. This meeting is being recorded. 
Um, and I also want to remind our audience members that you can feel free to drop any questions that come up as we proceed with this seminar into the Q&A box. So with that, we will start with the first question. So um, one of our pre-submitted questions asked, what makes a successful secondary? And is it okay to have less edits for it? So anyone can feel free to jump in on this. Um, I'm not quite sure what I mean by uh, less edits, but um, what I do say, if I understand, is that you want to make this, I, similar to what I just said, a very personalized to the school. So you should be making edits between secondaries and secondaries, but that is not to say you shouldn't reuse some content that you wrote from other schools um, and kind of reapply them in different areas and address the school specifically. Um, in fact, that's the kind of big reasons why you want to say organize, and so you can quickly reference similar questions, um, because there will be a lot of overlap between schools, and chances are there were, the majority of schools will have overlap, but there will also be questions that you, schools are really trying to elicit a certain type of uh, thinking, and those questions are usually the most important. And again, so every school treats secondary applications differently. I do student interviews for the MDPHD program, and I'm given um, a packet. So with your secondaries, along with everything else, but there's also programs that are completely blinded and they only see your secondary application. So um, it's very hard to judge how to uh, best approach this, but it's safe to make it unique to the school, but then also be smart and not have to waste your time and reapply previous responses. One other thing I'd like to add is that um, I agree completely with Scott's advice. It's really, really good advice. Um, but one thing I did want to add is that when you think about who's going to be editing your applications, um, there's kind of an optimal point. You definitely want other people to give you feedback because that feedback can be really useful, especially for your research themed essays. Um, if you have any of those during your secondary application, because you want to make sure that your uh, your essay is readable and it conveys your message without getting too technical. Having said that, there's kind of an optimal point um, and too many people's edits or suggestions or feedback can complicate how you write that essay and make it less your own. So I don't really want to give numbers because I think that number might be different for, for everybody, but I can share my personal experience, which is that I had two or three people look at my secondary applications, and I thought that that was a solid number of people. You just don't want too many people to read the essay because then it moves further and further away from your writing and it starts to incorporate a lot more people's advice if that makes sense and i'm happy to clarify that so feel free to ask questions i agree with the points that were given by um by my colleagues here but um i would also add that it, maybe this is a good time to talk about like the school's values as a way of personalizing um, your secondaries um something that i found to be very helpful was reaching out to current students in the programs that I was most interested in. Depending on the number of schools that you're applying to, it might not be realistic to do this, but um, for the schools that you're most, most interested in, reach out to students, have a, I mean, a 30 minute conversation with them. With that, you can, I think, get like the gist of um, what really matters to the school, sort of by, you know, you, you can probe them with specific questions about like, um, some of the things that they that they know the institution is important um, um you know what are some things that they've most enjoyed in their first year just things things that you'll you can kind of grab on to and then explore more um and remember when you're writing you know those personalized secondaries don't only talk about sort of what the value is but also what you're what you're going to be contributing to um in that in that sort of sphere um, so that's very important, not just like describe what it is you're attracted to in that school, but also how your experiences fit really nicely into what they find important. Awesome. I'm going to ask the next question. Um, so this is more geared towards the writing style. Um, and I have two questions, but in the same vein. So the first one reads, how do you balance good creative writing 
with answering the question and maintaining concision. And the second question is, what writing style should be used for the secondary essays? Should it be descriptive like the MD essay or the work and activity section? I can start off for this one. Um, I think, you know, it really is a personal decision. And I think it depends a little bit on what the prompt is asking of you. Uh, me personally, I found that most of the secondaries, you have pretty limited space. So if you're being asked a pointed question, I found that, you know, the most efficient way to show, you know, your thought process and share your answer was to be pretty straightforward rather than having like longer, uh, more elaborate creative writing. Um, but again, that depends if you have more space then maybe you can um, have the liberty to be a little bit more descriptive. Yeah, and to add on to that, to be more concise with your essays, definitely edits help a lot. I know when I was writing my essays out and I had them all typed up, I would, um, you know, show them to my girlfriend and she would say, hey, that's, that sentence is not needed there. So uh, it helps you write uh, more purposeful sentences, gets rid of all the fluff, and that you hopefully will have more of an impact with those secondaries that you do submit. I'd also want to add there that one thing that I had difficulty with during my application cycle was finding people to actually edit my essays who were also in the MD PhD space. I only knew one other person and he didn't have a whole lot of time to review my secondaries. So it actually ended up being my family that did that review and their feedback was really helpful. So don't worry too much if you don't have a lot of people in uh, med school or in an MD-PhD program who can review your application, or if you have no one at all, your family members can and friends can provide some really useful feedback too. Great. Um, one of the next questions um, is about how the secondary uh, prompts and responses should address examples and whether every question should be answered with an example from uh, the person's life. So if anyone has opinions on how that should be approached, feel free to share. I can start. Um, I think there's a lot of probably prompts that are helpful with an example. I think it helps committees to kind of imagine you in a space and get through your thinking process and see how you've responded in the past, you know, to kind of get a feel for you as an applicant and as a future student in their program. And something that helped me, especially as I started reviewing some of the previous secondary prompts for other schools, you know, a lot of them list them online from the years before, so you can kind of prepare for the types of questions they might ask you. There's certain buckets that a lot of the schools kind of fall into. Um, in terms of like what they want to know from you. They want to know maybe you're a team player and they can ask that in a certain number of ways or that you act ethically or that, you know, all of these sorts of things. And what I did that I found helpful and I know some of my friends did during the cycle was have a few like key examples. Like, okay, this is a really great example of when I navigated a hard situation at work. It shows that I can work in teams, but that I also can act ethically, but, you know, not cause a lot of friction or whatever. So having kind of a list of, of examples already kind of written down and fleshed out was helpful for me at least in saying, oh, I think in this question, they're really just trying to see, you know, this aspect of my personality or how I deal with situations. And then I already kind of had a typed up answer um, of, a, of an example of a story that I could kind of fit. And I ended up using a lot of the same ones on different applications. And then of course, like the, the length is sometimes different and um, you know, again, looking at the school's values could maybe tweak it a little bit, but having kind of a set list of example um, situations for my life was really helpful and helped me turn them around quickly. I would add to that, um, that it's, I think it's important to ground, first of all, I think it is very important to talk about your particular experiences. I think when your essays are very generic um, and they're not grounded in your life, then doesn't tell much to the admissions committee. So I think grounding it in a very good example of that is great. Um, 
but not just describing the example. I think it, we can, I fell into that a lot of just like being like, this is what happened, but it doesn't necessarily matter what happened. It's like what you learn from it and um, sort of interpret the story, you know, tell them what you learned from that. Or um, it's not just like descri description. The second thing I would say, um, I would pay attention when you're giving examples to the core competencies for entering medical students from the AMC. I'm going to drop the link uh, in the chat. Um, I think those are helpful to understand like what's kind of expected of students coming in and just sort of grounding that example in that particular competency and making sure that you're at least like adding some competencies here and some competencies there um, so they know that you're you know, well-rounded and you're ready to start this program. Awesome. So our next question is, how did you approach writing medical school specific secondary application essays versus MD, PhD specific application essays for the secondary application? Um, I think it's hard because it, every school's application is structured differently and depends on what, how well the MD PhD programs integrated within the missions. So some are joint admissions, some are separate. You have to get accepted into one in order to be the other. So it, it's, it depends, but I think the general thing is the MD PhD program, as you would expect, want you to explain why you will, why do you want to do this career path as a physician scientist and use examples and highlight yourself and uh, what is your history and your research and how that may blend into your medical interest. Um, how has your life journey accomplished that? However, on the other hand, the medical school is kind of, you could rely on what specifically the medical school adds to your that journey or to like, why does the medical school um, where does that fit into meeting your overall goals as a physician scientist? So you could rely on, for example, if a school has a, a student run clinic, that's not really specific to the MD PhD program, but you can talk about that aspect of why you want to go to this medical school and why it will be um, important for you to go there as part of your career to be a physician scientist. On the other hand, um, if there's some labs or some research facilities that are state of the art at that institution, that might be more appropriate to emphasize into the, uh, the MD, PhD specific essays as well. Great, I think that anticipates the next question really well, but um, another one of the questions was about when you answer the why X school question, how do you highlight MD specific program features, MD PhD specific program features, and then also things that are very unique to the school? I can talk about this one. So I had, I in my head while I was designing these essays, I had kind of a checklist. Um, and so I made sure that I talked about at least one thing about the MD curriculum or programs that were offered by the MD side. And one thing that was specific to the PhD programs or to the research opportunities available. And then one thing about um, like the region, if I wasn't from the region and other aspects of the school. So I made sure to talk about at least three or four things that interested me about the school. And I think it's important to talk about things that you really find interesting about a school and uh, talk about not only why they are interesting to you, but um, towards your education and, and furthering your goals, um, because schools really do rely on that. Um, to look at your interest and evaluate it when considering you for an interview and also for admission. Okay, I can move on to another question. Um, 
What do you think the importance of research versus them getting to know you as a person, both outside research and in medicine, is in writing secondaries and during the interviews as well? I, you know, I feel like I've given the same answer, but it depends, really does. So every school has their own different application process and how they review things. At my institution, the MD PhD program, you undergo five different interviews, a student interview, three faculty interviews, and then like a committee interview. And so each interview is going to target you with specific qualities that make you a successful um, uh, applicant or, or physician scientist in the future. So it depends on who is interviewing what, and um, you kind of have to prepare for everything. But I guess in terms of the secondary applications, uh, you it's your time to highlight kind of your um, uh, like your your significant experiences that really make you unique to a specific trait about that school. For example, if there's a specific program, um, PhD program uh, that you're interested in at uh, the institution, uh, you can express uh, specific names at this point as well, people that you might work with, and then also explain why you also make a good fit for that program and how it integrates with, with your, your interests. Um, on the other hand, uh, you also want to highlight your, your unique your new your unique traits that make you who different from other applicants as well so it's a unique blend it depends on the different the secondary prompt of course uh with the diversity and adversity essays you may be able to talk a little bit more about yourself rather than uh research specific secondary essays that some md phd programs have that's when your time where you really want to be concise and get to the point of why you're a best fit for that program Great. Um, for those of you in, uh, on the panel who have taken gap years, uh, could you speak more to how you described your gap year experiences in your secondaries? Um, I, I don't want to keep speaking, but I did. I did take gap years. I took four gap years. In fact, I did my master's. I worked uh, full time in in several different areas. I jumped around a lot. Um, I was kind of late into the physician scientist career path journey, I guess. No one really told me this existed way too late. So the fact that you guys are here is probably a huge step because I did not, I wasn't here. So anyways, I, I really enjoyed the gap year essays because I knew that's what would make me unique. You know, I didn't have to, no one else is writing about the same qualities about the institution. I mean, no one knows my journey more than I do. So that I, I really enjoyed writing those gap year essays, even though, it's like uh, more essays I have to write, you know, and um, but, you know, it's the same theme. Again, you could reapply the same concepts to each gap year essay across school. It's that's not that's totally OK. But again, it's it's there to highlight your unique journey and to answer not only what you did, but also why you did it and how it relates to your your journey as a physician scientist. Um, that why part is the most important and because um, it, people are going to gloss over it if you say if you're really to the point about you know you worked at this industry for x amount of years you did xyz but why you know and that's what's going to stand out and that's what's going to get brought up in the interviews and allow you to elaborate more on that yeah i also took several gap years and i think a big important piece of advice is they already have like your CV or your resume. So um, just like Scott was saying, it's really not a, just a list of what you did. Um, I did a post back because I didn't take all the pre-med courses. And then I managed um, anthropology projects, essentially, which is what I'm going into. And I think that was also a really great opportunity to kind of, I think throughout your whole application, it's good to have like this kind of tight narrative about yourself, like really how does each piece of evidence that you're providing these committees kind of act in service of letting them know who you are and what you're all about and your interests? And so 
you know, I was able to talk about, you know, I was taking classes, which is like the MD side of things. And then I am doing this research, which is my, you know, PhD side. And even if you do things that are completely unrelated to medicine or research that still feed into this, you know, it, it has brought you here, you know, all of these experiences come together in a specific way that's brought you to this application. And so really being able to kind of lay out that story in an easy way for them to digest and be like, oh, it makes complete sense. I totally see how you got here, I think is just um, a really unique and good opportunity and only can tell them more about you and make it stronger. I also wanted to highlight a little bit. Um, so my situation, I graduated a semester early and I did a post back for a year and a half. Um, so I definitely understand some of the concerns that I saw in the chat. I was answering a few questions about um, when you're not super sure what you're going to be doing and you're asked to write about what you're doing. And then um, so I, I can help alleviate some of those concerns. So I think um, talking about what you hope to be doing um, and that which might change, you know, if, if you're getting involved in research, talking about sort of the bigger picture as to why what you're doing is important um, and what makes you excited about it. I think showing excitement is one of the best things, I think, in these essays. Um, and people have commented like during interviews that that came through and that was something really positive. Um, and um, so, and I think I, I also want to take this opportunity to, to say that you're, you know, even the research that you're getting involved in right now, it might actually change in the future. And that's perfectly okay. Even if that's something that you have in mind that might change. I think um, the best thing that you can do is sort of maximize um, what you can get from the research that you've already done. So um, sort of express your interest in that and then just acknowledge um, internally that that might change and that's okay. Like, I think that's something that I was struggling with that I was thinking, oh, you know, I think what I wanna do later might be different to what I'm doing now. And I was kind of like really conflicted about that. Um, and I think just acknowledging to yourself that that's okay. <laughs> and then, moving forward with your application, I think I, I would have really benefited to hear that um, as someone who was kind of interested in switching gears a little bit um, in the future. So, yeah. Also kind of going in the same vein of gap years, um, one of the questions in our chat was about whether your gap year experience has to be research focused to be competitive for MD PhD programs or if it could focus on other areas of your personal development and interests. So if anyone would like to comment on that, please go ahead. I, I think oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. No, I already typed my initial response. So you go. Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear initial response, so I'm unbiased here. But I, I think it's, of course, it's not um, disqualifying if you don't have research experiences during those gap years. Um, kind of the theme of what we've been saying is, is kind of the why is more important than the what. Um, it is helpful, I'm not gonna um, say otherwise, that having more extensive and impactful and productive research experience will certainly help your application. Um, but you know the good thing about this career as a physician scientist everything you do is is going to be meaningful in terms of your journey in terms of training to get to this point so one way or another no matter what you do it's going to be important for your professional development um but the research experience it, it's it's a definitely a, a plus if you could show that you do have research experience you are continuing your research training and you could show it productive but again it's not disqualifying and that's nothing to stress about, out about. And I think it's nice to, oh wait, Zoe, you go, you go next, sorry. Oh, I pretty much said the same. Like you gotta make rent, you gotta live your life and be happy too before you go and anything you do, you'll be able to say why it was important to you, what you learned from it, transferable skills. That was kind of the gist, but yeah, go Mika. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I completely agree. And at the same time, I think if you're thinking of doing something that's not research, I think something that I, I wouldn't know because I didn't do that, but I think something to think about maybe would be, do I have enough research experience going into my gap year that will make me competitive for an MD PhD program? I think 
um, research experience is definitely very important going into the new PhD program because, you know, the expectation is that you love research, that you hope to be able to do research um, after you graduate. Um, that's why they're investing so much money into each and every one of us. Um, but um, so I think if, if you're if you're in a position where you've had a great research experience, you know, it spanned, you know, X number of years, there's no like magic number um, and it's been productive and you have great, you know, mentors that can write you letters. And um, then I think like you would be in a great place to, to like do something very different. And, um, but I think, yeah, I don't want to like underestimate the importance of research as an MD PhD applicant. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Awesome. Um, our next question is about approaching the prompts that focus with adversity. Um, so how did you approach those? Um, and in addition to that, like explain academic struggles and or um, approach like the difficult time essays. I can start this one off. Um, it's obviously going to be super personal to you what you choose to talk about. You know, there's a, adversity and means a lot of different things to a lot of different, different people and from different backgrounds. But I think, you know, being able to have an example that you can concretely sort of show some skills or things that you learned from the experience, the um, support you might lean on if you experience something similar during medical school, for example, could be a type of um, thing you talk about, you know, what you did to get through it and why this has taught you how you might get through it. You know, an MD PhD is a really long time. Life is going to totally happen to you in the next eight, 10 years, however long it takes you to do it. So they want to make sure too that, you know, you've faced hard things and all of you have, everybody has, right? You've done hard things before and you've, it's, you've still gotten to this point and how are you going to face them and what's your sort of approach and, you know, what kind of support do you have in your life or skills you've sort of curated? And um, I think, you know, people go into varying levels of personal, you know, details, that's kind of a preference thing. And again, whatever helps you tell your story, I think in what you're most comfortable with is probably the best litmus test for that. But um, I think people just really want to make sure that you've cultivated this. I don't always love using the word resiliency, but you know, you've, you've cultivated this ability and this toolkit that you'll be able to lean on and keep growing to be able to tackle whatever life throws at you during the training process, which is already hard enough while you're moving through all these other life stages. Yeah, that was a great way to describe it. Um, when I was writing my essays personally, I just had like a, have a, a loose structure where like once you're writing it, it's what was a tough time? Like describe situation how did it make your life difficult did it affect somebody that you cared about um and then you talked about how you overcame it or how you processed your emotions um and then you're able to utilize how you overcame it and process your emotions to say in the future if i encounter a similar situation you did that you, you will do this you will lean on this person you will engage with this activity to help with stress things like that and it kind of it's kind of blocky but you smooth it out. And I think it hits all three main points um, of, of like the difficulty essay. And it can describe, and you're able to show the admissions committee that, yeah, um, basically everything that Zoe described, like uh, they have that support structure, you know, you've, you've been through that hard time, you know how to get through that hard time. And um, I, I think that, that's how I approach mine anyway. Carl, your points were awesome in terms of just the structure. I think that's very important. And I think what you brought up brings up another point that I was advised to think about when thinking about the, these prompts, which is these are preferably things that have already happened to you, um, not something that you're currently dealing with. I know that like that doesn't, you know, these situations are not something that you can just like, you know, make like they're not not great situations and something that um, you can't really control a lot of the time. Um, but I think in order to have enough to say about it in terms of how you, you've processed it and what you've 
learned from the experience. Um, I think it should be something that preferably has already like passed and that you've had enough time to process. And I think like that's something that I was struggling with. Like I was thinking of talking about something that was happening to me right now. Um, but one, one of the NIH advisors, pre-med advisors, and I'm going to put their information down in the chat as well, um, because there are great free resources from the NIH pre-med, uh, pre-MD PhD office. Um, so I love them. We're super helpful. Um, they, they told me like, think about an experience that has already happened to you, because I think that's something that I was falling into a lot. Something else that I want to add to is, right, like these essays are going to be given a lot of the time, most of the time to the people who are doing your interviews. So it's important to know that anything you write about, you may be asked a question about in person. So make sure it's something that you're comfortable speaking about. Um, and so something you might consider avoiding is if there's a topic that's really impactful to you and it's really important, but you might get a little emotional when you try to speak about it, it might be a better idea to choose a different topic. Great, thank you everyone for all those comments. Um, we have another question from the open Q&A. Um, so it's considering how it is becoming more common for MD PhD applicants to take a gap year. Do you have any advice for traditional applicants to stand out or ensure there are no concerns with having fewer research hours or no publications? Sure, so I can I actually just uh, type this answer. Um, so if somebody else wants to go first, they can go right ahead. Um, but I think the traditional, being a traditional applicant is tough. You need to do research early, um, needs to be productive. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, I'm not sure if uh, it's, uh, I think it also depends school by school because some schools will, will want that that um, amount of research that you want to have cert uh, a certain publication or a first author or something like that. Other schools, they'll compare you relative to other applicants. So if other applicants have taken a gap year, they'll compare you relative to them, knowing that um, during that gap year, they may have time to have dedicated research to a certain topic. Um, so I'd say in one aspect, it depends, uh, but also um, the traditional applicant, being a traditional applicant, you have four years to get um, a lot of research done. So it's, uh, I think it's uh, difficult, especially when um, a lot more students are opting for um, post -backs, maybe taking a master's um, and extend research opportunities. And I think it's, it's fair to say that if you're applying straight through, I'm guessing that's what you meant by traditional applicant. Um, they know that they know that you haven't had one year, two years, three years, four years, you know, however number of gap years you you decided to take. Um, and so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't feel like that that's going to be sort of seen as something against you. Um, but I, I do agree, like you you definitely want to make sure going into the process that. You are competitive. You have done enough research. You, you do have enough of the clinical experiences, um, sort of the, the requirements of applying. Um, but I think they see you in the context of you. Um, so I think it's it's important to remember that. Um, also, to add to the points my wonderful colleagues have made, uh, something else is that programs are aware that publishing is not really we in your control, right? It, it's something that is your lab. It's another, um, another way for you to demonstrate that you really understand the topic that you're working on is through your essays and your interviews. Um, so. It can be really daunting to go into an application cycle without publications, but if you've put in a lot of work into that public um, into that research project and for reasons out of your control you're not able to publish, you can still demonstrate how the work that you've done by talking about it. Um, during a research talks because that's often a, a huge component of any uh, MD PhD. Uh, 
interview. So, so don't fret too much um, and use that interview time wisely in order to convey that knowledge, if, especially if you don't have a publication. Definitely, and to add to that and the resources that are available, um, a lot of times I know undergraduate uh, uh, schools, they'll have undergraduate specific research conferences. Um, you can also reach out to your uh, PI to say, hey, if you're going to this conference uh, in a year. Um, would I be able to be added to a poster on my current project? So things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely the research talks that like she said, it, uh, they're, they're great ways to uh, to share your research and also become more comfortable talking about your research because eventually when you get to the interview stage, you're going to be talking about your research. Some programs may have to have you do a chalk talk. So um, yeah, being really comfortable presenting on what you've done in the lab is, uh, is a really big skill. We have a couple uh, questions in the Q&A um, about like what is appropriate to disclose. So the first one's about, is it a red flag to write about mental health in essays? The second question is also, um, should people be transparent about like disclosing if they have like a disability um, and this person specifically is neurodivergent and how um, would that help or hinder, I guess, their application? I can start. Um, I definitely don't think you should feel like you have to cover or hide anything about yourself in this process. Like it's so cliche and you'll hear it a million times, but they really do just want to get to know you. And these are all of the ways in this kind of wild application cycle that they're just trying to figure out who you are, put a face to the name and a person to the application. So I think that again, in creating this kind of story about yourself that you're trying to tell through all these different pieces of writing, um, if this is, you know, if maybe your struggles with mental health have brought you to medicine and it's a passion that you've cultivated and you want to help others with this profession, I think that's totally a valid thing that you would want to talk about. If it's something that, you know, you just kind of work through personally on your own and it's it's not necessarily something you want to talk about in like an adversity essay, I don't, you know, I think that's kind of a, again, it depends on just how you would want to bring it in. Same with neurodivergence. Like you could have these super specific interests that are like, that might help your research in the future because you can really hone in on something. And like, that's a skill that, you know, will help you in your future career and maybe has brought you to this path too. So I think thinking about, you know, not necessarily like, oh, do I need to hide this or foreground it to make me a better or stronger applicant? But is this something about my identity that is worth people knowing to help them make sense of me and help think about how I'm going to move through my my career and this and this program? And um, not that you always have to paint it as like this is a secret skill that I have, but um, you know, maybe you can empathize with these kinds of patients. Maybe you can do X, Y, Z. So I think. Inter well, I guess maybe that is a skill, but you know, not necessarily being like, this is my superpower, but this is something about me that makes me me and will make will uh, you know kind of color my experience. And um, if it just helps people get to know you, then I think that you shouldn't have to feel like you need to hide it. Um, but also not necessarily that you have to like signpost it as something that's going to make you stand out either. I don't think anything you have like that kind of applies to lots of things about you and your identity. Yeah, I definitely agree with Zoe. Um, disability and it, it's it's still it it's somewhere it's it's a place in medicine where, um, like race, if they're treat if patients are being treated by doctors who might have the same conditions as, as them, they're likely to receive better care. Um, it is a place that can be re better represented in medicine as well. Um, there's a very low percentage of people with disability in medicine. So um, if you feel that this is going to be a boon to your application, you should definitely mention it. Um, but it comes with the same qualifiers as any other story that you tell about yourself, any other qualities or traits that you tell about yourself. How is this related to medicine? How do you think, as always said, how is this going to make you a better physician or take uh, take care of your uh, patients better? Or, or does it contribute to your story of why medicine? Um, but um so, so definitely don't feel don't feel that you have to hide it or anything. 
Um, but like Scott said, or maybe Zoe, you've said as well, um, anything that you do put on your secondary applications, you have to feel comfortable talking about it during interviews. And I know disability or some uh, significant challenges, uh, they might be difficult to talk about. But if you feel comfortable in um, your story and your path, uh, then yeah, go for it. Talk about it. Talk about how this is this is who you are, and uh, this is how uh, it'll help you become, uh, you know, uh, treat your patients a lot better. I'll also just add, you want to be accepted at a program that is also going to support you and not shy away from those kinds of things. Like if you even just mentioning some sort of disability or, you know, any other thing, this, this kind of goes to everything. Like if that is a turnoff, that is not the program for you. Um, so I think that like worlds are oyster, shine your light. I don't know. That's probably really, really cliche, but you really, if it, if it's that much of a hindrance to your application, that is not the program that you're going to feel supported in living with that lived experience that you're thinking about sharing or not on the application. I think it's also important to think about how you frame this, um, whatever it is that you decide to share, um, as, a, as opposed to it being, um, as, as, as we said before, sort of as opposed to just descriptive, thinking about like what sort of in, interpret the, give context, um, say what you've learned. Um, I think it, you know, I think that's important to remember with any kind of lived experience, but I think um, with this in particular, yeah. Um, I just want to echo the idea of being supported at your program. This is going to be true for everyone. You want a program that will support you and your needs, whatever they are. So hearing, could you try um, shutting off your video and see if that improves the audio? It's for you that program. Okay, does that help? Okay, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm clearly having bandwidth. <laughs> okay, so let me repeat what I said one more time. I'm echoing what everyone has said so far about support. It's really important to feel supported in your program for whatever your needs are, and that's going to be different for everyone. Make sure that when it comes time for you to select a program, you're going to a program that makes you feel supported. Um, that's, I think, the number one thing you want to look for in a program, because you're dedicating a large portion of your life to this program, and you want to pick a place where you feel heard, you feel supported, and you feel like your needs are being met. So make sure that that's something that you keep in mind as you're making your selection. That was all great advice. Um, we have a few more questions that are more general uh, to the whole application process rather than just secondaries. So I'm going to shift gears and focus on some of those. Um, so the first question is, if you all were able to apply all over again, what is one thing you would have changed? Um, or what is one thing you wish you would have done differently? Share all your regrets. <laughs> I can start and I don't mind being transparent about this. I didn't get any MD only interviews. And I think a lot of it is because I just didn't take the time to craft MD specific materials and MD PhD specific materials. Um, and I know a lot of people do. I just didn't need to spend the money and time doing all of that if I wasn't going to, you know, actually be that competitive of an MD applicant. There's other things that are specific about being a non-traditional PhD person that is specific to my trajectory as well. But um, yeah, I think in some ways this can kind of be a numbers game. It's a super competitive field. You know, there's not that many spots at each place, et cetera, but you don't want to also waste your own money and time. Um, it's already a pretty arduous process. I can go next. Um, so I mentioned this in the beginning, but I absolutely underestimated how much time that this was all going to take 
I think when I was starting, right, I poured so, so, so much time and energy to crafting this like really awesome primary application that I was super proud of. Um, and then I took a little break and, you know, I was brainstorming, I was journaling, I was thinking. Um, but when like it really came time to start writing and writing quickly and writing a lot of applications quickly, it felt pretty overwhelming. And I don't think I really had a sense when I started that so, so, so many of those prompts are available for you and for everyone online. They don't really change that much year to year. And if they do, it's probably pretty similar to another school's prompt that's already out there. And so like, like I cannot emphasize enough, even if you, you know, don't want to write the whole essay or aren't able to write the whole essay, like look at the prompts, get some bullet points down, think about what you might want to talk about. Um, so you're ready when the time does come around, because it really does take quite a bit of time to write all these essays. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. Um, I think I was, I did not uh, get into any program the first time I applied out. So I was a reapplicant and I look back similar to what was already discussed. There's this process, there's like a, a science behind all this. There's a strategic element to how you apply to schools, which schools you want to apply to, timing of everything, applying early, when you, which essays you want to do first when you get secondary essays. Um, and so I, I didn't really understand the process fully and what needs to be done at this point in time. At what point do medical schools review your application? So I, if I could go back in time to the first time I, I applied, I would have really understood exactly what the application process is right. It, it looks like and at what points in time um, does your application get reviewed by the schools, for example, and when do you expect for interviews to be sent, sent out? Um, there's there's a really there's a lot of um, this process there, there it's 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 a crazy process it's not the easiest and there's a lot of moving parts and it's getting more complicated by the year um, however there's a lot of data and research out there I mean we're all interested in research so there you could treat this as a science and try to figure out learn exactly what the application process entails and that will make it easier in terms of staying organizing and emphasize the importance of timing and planning out your summer. I can go next and I'm going to turn my video off so we don't have bandwidth issues again. Um, I had kind of a different regret about my application cycle. I love the program that I'm in um, and I've really, really enjoyed my time here. But when I was applying, I had this thought, a very persistent thought that I wasn't going to get in anywhere. So I had, I, in a lot of ways, I could have applied to um, some schools that I didn't apply to that are, that would have been really, really good fits for me, but that I didn't apply to because I didn't think I had a chance. So definitely there is a science, as Scott was saying, to how you apply. And it really is important that you're applying broadly and you're applying to um, as many programs as can feasibly fit in your budget since admissions are so competitive. But having said that, do have some faith in yourself, right? You're here, you can do this process. It's really competitive and it's stressful, but I believe in all of you. So have a little bit more confidence than I did. <laughs> My biggest regret with the application cycle was that like uh like john said i got so overwhelmed with secondary prompts it all came in all at once and i felt like i had all these essays to write and i feel like i tackled those essays looked at the secondary application prompts earlier it would have given me more time to work on the research essays or, or like the the um uh what interest what what research are you interested in essays and um i felt like i rushed that too much and i should have looked a little bit more see what professors had a better fit, maybe ask around a little more, send a couple of emails. Um, but yeah, I was really rushed in that process. So if I could do that all over again, I would spend a little more time on that uh, and, and crafting really good research essays to why does my previous experience uh, and interests fit the school I want, uh, I'm applying for. I can go next. Um, I, I would say I have two pieces of advice or things that I would have done differently. Um, one, I think with secondaries, because 
the lengths um, and the word count of each essay across, you know, there's like similar prompts, but different lengths. Um, that was super overwhelming to me, feeling like I needed to like rewrite a bunch just because it was like smaller or longer or whatever. Um, so I think just what I would have done differently is thinking about what are the themes like, or what are the experiences that I definitely want to get through to the admissions committee in this secondary, basically like what you haven't covered in the primary, um, and then make sure to communicate that um, in whatever length they tell you. So I, I would say pick, you know, a few experiences that you for sure want to communicate, parts of your identity that you hadn't talked about, you know, extracurriculars that you have, weren't able to fit into your activity section or whatever it might be. Um, and just make sure to, to talk about those in, in your secondary. So I would have, I would have definitely benefited from that instead of being overwhelmed by the lengths and the number of prompts and whatever. Um, and then the second thing, you know, I'm the first one in my family to do any kind of medicine or anything like this. Um, and so, as you know, everyone has, talk, has talked about this like grueling process that gets more complex by the year. I definitely agree with that. And especially when you're starting to get to know it from scratch, um, it can feel very overwhelming. And so I would say um, something that I did that I'm really glad I did in, in this process was reach out to, to people who can help you in this process, whether that's like, you know, us, you know, a few years down the line from you, we were in your shoes, literally like for me last year. Um, and, and, and ask like, what are the kinds of things that I should be thinking about now that I've submitted this secondary or now that I've you know, gotten my first interview or now that I just interviewed, like what should I, so there's like certain things that you should be thinking about at each stage in this application process. And I think if you, if you don't know that, it's hard to know what you don't know, right? So it's good to ask and don't be shy. We're all, we all know exactly what you're going through and uh, we can definitely help. So don't be shy, uh, reach out. We're happy to help, um, you know, advisors in your universities who might be there or advisors in your post experience um, or just, you know, current students um, who may advise you on, on next steps and what to be thinking about. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And we are one minute away from the end of this webinar, so I'm just going to close with a few quick remarks. But thank you to everyone for joining us for the Q&A session today with the current students. Um, I want to obviously thank our panelists for taking the time out of their day to participate and um, share their words of wisdom with all of you. And I also want to thank all the participants for their eager engagement and for keeping our Q&A chat so eventful. Um, in addition to all of you all here, um, I wanted to thank APSA's Diversity Ad Hoc Committee, the PR and Partnerships Committee, um, and APSA leadership as well, who've also been an integral part of organizing these webinars and sessions for the whole year. Um, and we also want to thank the work that they've done with the underrepresented in medicine applicants as well to ensure that th these sessions are made available to the widest uh, group of applicants and prospective students. So um, with that, our next interactive session is scheduled for August 10th, and that will be a general Q&A with current dual degree applicants. Um, the registration link is in the Zoom chat that Jenny just posted. Um, so feel free to register there and it'll be similar to the session as well. Um, and any questions that we didn't get to today that were outside of the field of secondary applications, you're more than welcome to ask at that session. Um, so feel free to join that session and just stay tuned with social media for APSA and look out for further emails from all of us to register for these upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. record one. Hello, this is Rohini Gwyn, a member of the American Physician Scientists Association Virtual Content Committee. Today's episode is on the topic of secondary applications. Our panelists are Mika, an M2 at UCSF, Akshata, a G1 at University of Cincinnati, 
Jonathan, an M2 at Emory University, Carl, an M1 at Indiana University, Scott, a G1 at the University of Florida, and Zoe, an M1 at the University of Michigan. The show notes for the episode will link to more information on our panelists, information for dual degree applicants, and much more. Thank you and enjoy the episode.